A very warm welcome from St Paul's Cathedral. My name is Paula Gooder and I'm the Canon Chancellor here at St Paul's, which means that I oversee the theology and learning that takes place within the life of the cathedral. Now normally, at this point, I would be welcoming hundreds of you under the dome as we ready ourselves to listen to our speaker. But of course, at the moment, this isn't possible. So instead, we have pre-recorded a conversation between myself and Timothy Radcliffe, which you will hear in a few moments. Timothy Radcliffe is a well-known Dominican friar and best-selling Christian author. He has written a large number of books, and the book we'll be discussing today is his most recent book, Alive in God, A Christian Imagination. As you will notice, our conversation ranged widely from Catherine of Siena all the way through to Bette Midler, taking in music and novels and theology on, on the way. You'll even discover why Timothy nearly got expelled from school and what he was reading at the time. This is the first in a series of conversations and we're still working the technology out. So you'll notice a couple of times in the conversation that the sound crackles, but we hope that you'll still be able to know what's going on through the captions. We've now fixed the problem and hope that, that for the next two conversations, the sound will be perfect. Our conversations coming up are with John Swinton, talking about his book, Finding Jesus in the Storm, and with Bishop Sarah Mullally, talking about her new Lent book. Timothy, a very warm welcome to you and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I absolutely loved reading your book, Alive in God. Can you tell me a little bit about what made you write it? Was there anything in particular that said now is the moment to write that book? Well, well first of all, what happened was I had dinner with some friends and they had two children. Uh, we discovered in the, in the course of dinner that one of them was a devout Christian, really turned on by her faith, whereas the other had no interest at all. Uh, and I found this fascinating. They'd grown up in the same household. They, they were very similar in character, the same interests, the same passion for justice. But for one of them, religion was exciting, and the other simply couldn't see the point of it. It was, it was a sort of uh, a nullity for her. It was a language that didn't mean anything to her. And I was reminded of my dear mother when she came to visit me in Santa Sabina. And I was extremely enthusiastic about this painting by a Korean Dominican, Kim. Very abstract, wild colors. And I took my mother into my office and I said, isn't it wonderful? My mother said, well, my dear, it looks rather like your habit after an exceptionally dirty breakfast. <laughs> so I thought somehow, we, how can I touch, how can I touch the imagination of, of someone like that child for whom it means nothing? nothing. And then I was always, always too busy to have time to write it. There were always lecture tours and pastoral work and people to see. But then I got cancer. And uh, for months, I was confined to my room. It was even suggested that I might not be able to speak publicly again because of the operation, which was rather frightening. So this gave me a time alone when I thought, what can I do? So I sat down and I wrote the first the first draft of the book then. So what would you say is the real heart of the book? If someone read it and got what you really hoped that they would get from it, um, what would that be? I think the very heart of it is trying to enter the imagination of somebody for whom religion doesn't make much sense. And in a way, that's quite easy because that's me. Uh, one of my close friends, David Sanders, Sanders. who died of COVID uh, a few weeks ago, David often used to say to me, Timothy, you're a patient. And in a sense, he's right. Uh, I'm not a, a naturally pious person. 
liturgy doesn't get me excited. Uh, I don't boil with excitement about going to Mass on a Sunday. So a lot of, of my own sort of, uh, my own imagination isn't very religious at all. In fact, I like to tell how I was almost thrown out of school uh, for reading Lady Chatley's Lover during Benediction. <laughs> That's very funny. So, uh, I think I'm very much the sort of person who has to say periodically, I believe, help my unbelief. So I was having to, to look carefully at my own struggles, if you want, to make sense of my life. When that meant looking for God in the ordinary. I, I, love, I love that phrase from George Herbert, Easter in ordinary. And trying to find that religious experience isn't something apart, you know. Religious experience, the hints of transcendence, they're there in our ordinary lives, in our ordinary falling in love and enjoying life and friendship and having feasts and, and being with friends. All this is part of our journey to God. And I found struggling to understand, to, to come to terms with the non-religious imagination, there, there were two areas that particularly fascinated, two of the chapters that I, I most enjoyed reading. One was the question of violence, mm -hmm. and the other was the question of liturgy. Because I think we live in a very violent society. It's filled with verbal violence. We're more and more aware of the violence against women, the violence against children, which is the terrible affliction of sexual abuse, violence against the planet. And what I came to realize was that in our violent world, uh, Jesus appeared as the one who said, put down your swords. And at the very heart of early Christianity was this non-violence. And that this is something that can speak to our society very powerfully. It's something that speaks to me very powerfully when I'm grappling with my own bits of unbelief. I had to return to the non-violent Jesus who has God's deep tranquility in his life. And the other area, of course, was the liturgy, because I'm not a, a naturally liturgical person. And other people get so excited by copes and berettas, but they rather turn me off. I don't know about St. Paul's. And therefore, I had to come to reflect on worship. Because I think we all worship. We all have rituals of worship. It might be money might be sex, power. And God is the one whose worship is liberating. God is the one who, when we worship him, he says, stand up on your feet. He's the only one who sets us free in our worship. So beginning with, with violence and with liturgy, I try to find the way in which the barriers between um, we say the non-religious and, and the religious are overthrown. And anyone who helps us to understand those helps the religious imagination, They're our allies. That's why when I want to think about a, a, some topic in theology, I think who are the poets, who are the novelists, the filmmakers, the blog writers, who are going to help me to come alive uh, to think creatively. All uh, Anybody creative, it seems to me, is the ally of the religious thinker. So, Timothy, I think that whole idea about imagination that you just mentioned is particularly interesting. And it's clearly the key to this book. It's in the subtitle and it bubbles all the way through the, your narrative, really. Um, but isn't the word just a little bit dangerous? Aren't there too many people who think that we already imagine God? So can you tell us a little bit a little bit more about what you mean by the word imagination? Uh, yes, Paula, this is an objection that I've received from time to time. Aren't we all just making it up? I've tried to avoid 
long definitions because I think they can be off-putting. But perhaps I could just say this, there's imagination, there's the imaginative, and there's the imaginary. By imagination, I simply mean a way of looking at things. It, it's the world you inhabit. So when I was a young student, I had the great joy of going to, to live in Paris for a year. And I loved trying to, to live in a French world. I used to go to cafe and, and smoke a gourouise and, and have a little glass of beer and read Le Monde and pretend I was French. To be French, to see a French world. But there are also scientific imaginations. We had one of our brethren was a geologist and traveling with me. Um, he could show me how to see the world geologically. You, you can see the world cynically or charitably. So that's the first thing. Imagination, I, I mean, just a, a way of being in the world. Obviously, imaginative suggests a very vivid way of seeing the world. And imaginary means that you made it up. But of course, they're not exclusive. Uh, if you take The Lord of the Rings by Tolkien, it offers an imagination, a Christian imagination as it happens, because Tolkien was inspired above all by his Christian faith, the Eucharist. It's also highly imaginative, but it's also imaginary in a sense that he made up that world. But it's an illuminating one. Or Harry Potter would be the same thing. And alas, I'm afraid I am not the uncle of Daniel Radcliffe. And I'm just offering a Christian imagination. This is my Christian imagination. And there are many forms of Christian imagination. Protestant, Anglican, Catholic, Orthodox, um, medieval, modern. So this is just one example. But what I would say is that all Christian imaginations have this in common, is that they are open, they're not reductive. Because a characteristic of modernity, I think, is the temptation of fundamentalism. It could be scientific fundamentalism, the, thing that, the temptation to think that everything can be reduced to scientific terms, or economic fundamentalism. It's the market, it's the economy, stupid. Or even worse of all, it could be religious fundamentalism. The fact that uh, our religion becomes reduced to a very literal narrow meaning of some text, whether it's the Bible or the Quran or anything. But I think a healthy Christian imagination is always open. It's always opening doors. It resists what Mary Midgley, the Newcastle philosopher, called nothing buttery. Nothing is nothing but economics or, or whatever. It takes the roof off. I loved a novel by Emma Donoghue, Room, in which she describes this woman captured, kept in a small shed with her son, and they escape. They go out into the open air, they breathe fresh air. Now it seems to me that a healthy Christian imagination is like that. It releases you from confinement. It takes you out into a world filled with color and oxygen. So there's something about creativity in imagination then, something that sees the world in a bigger form and draws us onwards, would you say? Is Absolutely. If we're made in the image and likeness of God, I think that doesn't mean to say that God has got a couple of ears and a mouth and so on. Though he came to have one in Jesus Christ. But what's what is, is that we share a little bit of God's creativity. And that chimes in, doesn't it, to the strand that runs alongside imagination in the book, um, the Alive in God strand. Um, I think one of the things that I really love about how you express things in the book is this whole strand of living fully. 
um, the fullness of life um, that you get. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what that means for you and why that's so important in the book? I, I love the phrase in Deuteronomy when God says, I put before you life and death, choose life. And I think the whole of, of our faith is really choosing life. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, not survive. Jesus didn't say, I came that you may survive and survive abundantly. But what does it mean to be alive? Uh, and it's not just a question of the heart beating, you know, uh, the lungs uh, filling and emptying. Being alive starts with our bodily existence, um, I think. We are bodily. Thomas Aquinas said uh, something wonderful. He said, non sunt, non sum anima mea. I am not my soul. We are bodily beings. And so I think in a world, a society, which is often very ambiguous about the body, there's a lot of hatred of the body, a lot of fear of the body, a lot of illness associated, alas, with the body. I think Christianity, if it invites us to live, says also, don't be afraid of your bodily life, your breathing. The whole drama of redemption begins and ends with breathing. God breathes into Adam, breathes out on the cross, breathes in on Easter morning into the disciples. And I think all the aspects of our, of our bodiliness, our touch, our sense of, of sight, our faces. Christianity is the religion of the face, the physical human face. The spiritual life, I think, is learning to be a face and to see faces. And it goes facing death as well. But there's also the question of being emotionally alive. Uh, Ezekiel says, I've taken away your heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh, a fleshly heart, which therefore can feel pain and joy. So we have to come alive emotionally, creatively, as I said. So the opposite of being alive, I don't think it's necessarily most radically being dead, because we all die and we hope, believe, we rest in the Lord. The opposite of being alive is to be a zombie. To, and that's why I wrote the chapter on affliction. Affliction, the favorite word of Simon Weil, the wonderful mystic. She said that she met in the factory people who had become zombies, slaves. I'm really interested by um, your connection there between bodies and spirituality. It's something I've long been interested in as well. And it's, it causes me to wonder, what would our prayer lives, what would our spiritual lives look like if we were more serious about our bodies? Are there things that we need to do differently? Because often I feel that when we talk about spirituality, we kind of mean stuff that's not your body. It's not connected to how you live in your body. And I wonder if you've kind of reflected on that at all. Well, certainly Sir Dominic, the founder of the order to which I belong, he has his nine ways of prayer, and they're all bodily. They're all physical. Yes. They involve kneeling and prostrating and standing up and stretching out your arms. And when I joined the order, our prayer, when we recited the office, was very bodily. We were always bowing and standing. And at last, I think, we made a mistake at the second, after the Second Vatican Council of thinking that it was mental, mental prayer. And I think C.S. Lewis, perhaps more than anybody, deeply realized how physical prayer should be. In the screw tape letters, you know, the wise old demon says to the, the young demon, always let them make the mistake of thinking that their prayer has nothing to do with their bodies. So how we sit, how we breathe, these are all absolutely fundamental dimensions, I think, of the life of prayer. And I think, thanks be to God, uh, we've received much from the East. I started practicing yoga when I was 16 at school. 
and have practiced it on and off. And I think that yoga has been immensely enriching for a lot of people in rediscovering how to sit, how to breathe, how to be in our prayer. One of the things that absolutely fascinated me when I was reading the book, um, and of course, um, I would love this because I'm a New Testament scholar, but I loved how you told the story through the lens of the life of Jesus. You know, how it kind of, it, I'm doing this with my arm because it's an arc of the story, isn't it? It's through the life of Jesus. And can you just tell us a little bit more about why that felt important to you to do? Um, it, there seems to be something really quite significant in the way in which you've kind of stitched all of this together through the lens of the life of Jesus. Well, what he usually says at the beginning to any of his disciples is, come, follow me. And that's the invitation to embark on an adventure. And so often we're reductive with Christianity. We, we reduce it to being a moral, an ethics, um, a discipline, whereas it is a setting out. And it's a setting out on an adventure, which makes Gandalf's invitation, I think, to... The hobbits look very tame indeed. And all the way through the story, you see how he takes us in different stages. Uh, at the beginning, basically, he is a healer and he is an exorcist. Very standard things in first century Palestinian Judaism. But these are just the initial skirts. He's preparing himself for the great combat against evil in which his life will culminate. And so we see as he sets out to Jerusalem that uh, we have to travel with him. Forgiveness. I love the fact that forgiveness is not just letting go of the past and wounds. It's actually embarking on an adventure. It's refusing to let yourself be cramped by caught by what has happened in the past. It's refusing to be caught, trapped in resentment. I think back to that extraordinary scene on November the 15th when there was that terrorist attack in Paris. And the next day, Antoine Léry, I think he was called, spoke about the death of his wife, Hélène. And he said, I will not be trapped in hatred. I will not be trapped in fear. He was going to go on living. And as you know, Paula, as well as I do, we live in a very scared society, which is filled with health and safety regulations, which is scared of adventure, which always wants risk assessment every time we do anything. And in such a society, I think, the adventure to which Jesus summons us is frightening. Um, but uh, uh, we must embark. One of my uh, favorite Dominicans was Herbert McCabe. We lived next door to each other for, for almost 20 years. And Herbert loved to say, if you love, you will get hurt. You may even get killed. If you don't love, you're dead already. So let us embark on the adventure, uh, which is that of forgiveness, and ultimately of getting hurt, of being vulnerable, and of sharing the victory over all that may mortify us, all that might make us into zombies. <laughs> Um, I loved the whole book, actually. I kind of I was absolutely gripped by it. But there was a chapter that really snagged my attention. And I kept on coming back to it time and time again because it snagged my attention so much. And it was the chapter on growing up. There was something that resonated very profoundly with me, that idea of the importance in the life of discipleship of growing up and becoming mature. Um, I'm wondering if you would just like to talk to us a little bit about why for you growing up is significant, because it did feel like it was an, an important moment in the book. I mean, what happens if we don't? I, I think growing up is, is so important because we live in a crisis. I think our society is going through a crisis of childhood. I think the whole sex abuse crisis yeah. is symptomatic of a society in which children often don't get their childhood. 
and grown-ups don't often grow up either. Children get secularized, sex sexualized, uh, and grown-ups get infantilized. Uh, and so the adventure of growing up is a fundamental one, I think, for our society and for our church. Given the history of abuse, how can we dare to talk about it? I hope that because we fail so badly, we can learn to do this well. And I think one of the first things about being a child is that they have to have time. They have to have time to grow up. They have to have time to make mistakes. So I took the parable of the prodigal son. Because here you get a kid, could have been a son or a daughter, who just has a great He makes, he makes a mistake in his life. Uh, he tries to grab adulthood prematurely. And of course, in the early church, one of the models of the fall was not some terrible, terrible failing, a drastic sin. For Irenaeus, for example, second century theologian, it was a premature grab at adulthood. Christ comes to give us our, children, our childhood again, that we may grow up into being joyful, spontaneous, childlike adults. What, one of the ways that we do this is getting outside the self. Because, um, I mean, I've never had any children, uh, probably just as well for, for them. But uh, I think so often in, in childhood, we can be caught in the eye. I remember as a child sulking. I was caught in my selfish sulk. I was the center of the world. The eldest son, at the end of the parable, he's a child trapped, sulking on the edge of the party. How do we release people from this narcissism? And in a society which is often fascinated by the eye, the iPhone, the iPad, you know, the iPod, I, I, I. So learning to let go of the center. I always love that line, Bette Midler from The Beaches, when she says, that's enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? <laughs> yes. The elder son in the end is invited to, to give himself to the music, to give himself to the dance, to surrender. I came across a song the other day, Surrender to the Boogie by the Mojo Machine. And that letting go is the liberation that we need. And if you do that, you might become like the parent. Yeah. Because the parent is the childlike adult. He has the spontaneity and the joy for which uh, we all long. I first met it, I think, in my great uncle Dick, who I've often talked about, who was a Benedictine monk, uh, Dom John Lane Fox. And he was the most joyful person, I think, that I've ever met. Um, and he... He was a chaplain in the First World War, terribly wounded. He lost an eye and some of his fingers. But the sorrow, the pain of the First World War tenderized him. It gave him a large heart so that he was able to rejoice and be filled with joy, almost like a childlike way. He would never get to bed at night, even when he was in his 90s. My mother would have to lure him upstairs by leaving glasses of whiskey on the, on the staircase. So I think that growing up is a, a task that awaits us all. It certainly awakes me. Yeah. I'm very aware that I, I haven't made it yet fully. And I love that line in the prodigal. So one of my favourite moments is, you know, when the um, the son is in the pigsty in the far, far off land um, and he comes to himself. And when he comes to himself, he suddenly realizes his relationship 
And so the thing that he remembers is his relationship with his father. And I think that's the moment where he, as you say, grows up. Because in coming to himself, he realizes that in looking at the eye, he's forgotten his network of relationships and what that gives to him. Exactly. And he sees his father in a new way. Yes. You think at the beginning of the, of the parable, the father is the problem. The father stands in his way, stands in his way of pleasure and wealth. But when he comes to himself, he says that his father cares for all his servants. He sees his father differently. He doesn't see his father as a rival. Uh, and I think that, that growing up is largely about learning to see other people in ways that are not rivals. They don't compete for oxygen. In fact, they give us oxygen that we may live. And they help us to understand the Trinity, which is, of course, the ultimately non-rivalrous love. Um, one of the things that is also absolutely fascinating about this is, is of course, you are a, a Dominican, and the Dominican order is about teaching, and particularly teaching dogma. Um, how do you think dogma relates to imagination? It's in, on one, if you'd asked me in advance, I'd have said, well, they don't really go together. But as I was reading the book, I began to see how they do go together. And I was wondering how you, if you'd like to talk about that for a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm extraordinarily grateful that you say that, Paula. You know, you write away and you wonder whether it makes sense to anybody. <laughs> the initial conviction, of course, is that Jesus was a teacher. His final act in the face of death in John's gospel is to teach. Faced with death, he teaches. You might think it's an odd way to confront one's own mortality. And right at the end of Matthew's gospel, he commissions them to go away and teach. So Christianity is a doctrinal religion. It gives us teachings, dogma, as you say. And the temptation of our society is to think that doctrine is doctrinaire and that dogma is dogmatic, which, of course, I believe them to be quite the opposite. I think good dogma opens the imagination. It says, don't go down this road. It doesn't go anywhere. That's not a fruitful way to explore things. But in the end, it's always inviting you in the adventure of thinking and entering the mind of the Lord, the spaciousness of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is broad, heresy is narrow. It's, uh, it's uh, idiotic in the literal sense of the word, can narrowing us to what is only of our own understanding. If you look at something like the, the doctrine of, of Jesus, Chalcedon, it is truly human and truly divine. A great temptation is to think that he's truly human, just human. Uh, a really nice guy, you know, a model for us all, pleasant ethic. But that's to diminish our belief drastically, as it would be to say that he is just God, somehow some sort of puppet figure adopting a, adopting a humanity that is not really his own. But the great doctrine, he is truly human and truly divine, is an invitation to go on struggling to understand, to glimpse a truth that we never, ever fully capture. Perhaps we only best express it when we get most poetic, straining at the edge of language. Think of the Trinity. It's not basically about numbers, you know like counting the number of angels on a pinhead in that mythical story. The doctrine of the Trinity takes you into the, the mystery of a love which is both mutual and outturned, which is the Father and the Son, but it overflows to all of us. Uh, and that's a truth which we can only explore, I think, in the end artistically. That wonderful book by Sarah Copley, which I so love. Uh, I think it's called God, Sex uh, and Doctrine, something like that. And Sarah shows 
Uh, how, when you really are trying to enter that mystery, you're resorted to one of the images, like the triple has in Padamon Cathedral, dancing around each other. Or, or Meister Eckhart, the, uh, the early Dominican mystic, who uses lovely images of horses galloping in fields. Or the doctrine of the real presence, which is uh, of Jesus in the Eucharist, which is important to so many Christians. A claim is how you can get it wrong, but perhaps when you want to get it right, he shows this best in his poetry. So I think all dogma enlivens the imagination and it leads us to poetry, to art, to music, to painting, to films. We're reaching the end of our conversation um, for today, but I just want to ask you one further question. You wrote the book um, before um, we entered um, this time of coronavirus and lockdown and all the stresses and strains that have emerged from this time. Um, is there anything in what you wrote that you would want to say particularly to those of us who are struggling at the moment with all the stresses and strains that come from the coronavirus and how we face it? That's a fascinating question, Paula. I, I would say two things very briefly. I should have been miles away if it had not been for coronavirus. I had a really exciting travel program of lectures going all over the world. Not very good for the environment, I must admit. I've learned that. And what this virus has shown is that we are not as much in control as we thought. Central to humanity's self-image in recent centuries has been what's been called the culture of control. And Charles Taylor shows how this, this developed in the 16th, 17th century. Centralization of the state. The idea that we can manage, manipulate, administer everything. It's therefore our use. But the coronavirus has shown how hollow that claim is. We're not in control of everything. We've been rendered a bit impotent by a tiny bit of jelly. And maybe that can be a liberation if it helps us to become aware of the way that God's providence is secretly, discreetly working in our lives. Not as if God was controlling everything, but God is there quietly. His benevolence is working away, bringing us to himself and to freedom and to happiness. And finally, a lot of us have had to practice self-isolation. We've been locked in our rooms. I'm lucky I, I live in a community with some young people. But for many people, it's been a time of isolation. And that makes me think of St. Catherine of Siena, who in, I think it was uh, 1347, went into three years of of auto-isolation. She wanted to discover God. Actually, she discovered herself. She entered what Catherine called God. the self, self of self-knowledge. Self and in that self-knowledge, she, she discovered her, that she, she was God. God. And the no, no, isolation God. is it brings you face to face with yourself. And when you see yourself, may you, you discover that it is a self that is loved. The masks go, but you find that you're not alone. And maybe you become more able to live with other people. You can build stronger communities. You can live with them because you can live with yourself. So a final image I would offer is all those Italians on the balcony. They're on their balconies, they're clapping and they're singing. And it's the paradox of the pandemic because each of them is in their own apartment. They're alone or with their immediate family. But they're also a new sort of community because they're there together in song. And so perhaps what this pandemic has taught us, can teach us, will teach us perhaps, 
is both how to be alone and how to be together. And perhaps also how to be alive in God. Um, Timothy, thank you so much for your conversation. Um, it's been a real pleasure and I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula.